Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to see you all again uh, in this live session. Um, before we start uh, today's presentation, I'm going to talk about a few things. First of all, it's about the exam. Uh, in the following week, um, I will talk about the exam and uh, how you can prepare yourself for the exam, what kind of materials you need to review before the exam. So I would like to encourage everyone to attend in the following meeting. So in the following live session, all of the students, they should attend because if you've got any question, we can discuss it and answer it. But after uh, week 10, uh, most of the um, tutors and mentors and other people are not available. So if you get question, then you we will have a delay to uh, respond. So I guess it's, it's a good idea to attend the live session in week 10. Uh, in terms of uh, today, we have uh, a presentation right now. Uh, we've got two uh, guests going to talk about very important uh, topic and uh, they are going to share with us um, uh, their experience working uh, in different projects. So uh, after this at 11 a.m. we are going to um, uh, continue the session with tutorial. So uh, tutors will be available after uh, 11 a.m. So you can find the file, the PDF file and the slides available on, on Moodle. So the presentation file will be available on Moodle. I'm not sure what's happening because the screen shows a different page at the moment. Yeah, I guess, um, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, right now it's good. Okay, all right. So uh, right now I'm going to introduce you two of uh, fantastic practitioners and designers, uh, Jason and John. So first of all, I'm going to uh, ask Jason and John to have a, a quick introduction about themselves and introduce themselves. And then uh, uh, Jason is going to start the presentation. Uh, good morning, Jason and John. Good morning, Sabat. I'll probably start because I'm going to kick off the presentation and then I'll let Jason introduce himself as well. All um, right, perfect. So my background is um, engineering in uh, mega projects around the world. And uh, I work with Jason and Peter Al Brabbers as director of um, Clever Planning with Geology. And uh, that's a quick summary for me. Excellent. So, uh, uh, yeah, so you can uh, inter uh, introduce yourself as well. Yeah, so uh, Jason Airy is my name. Uh, I, um, I run OEMG Global and together with, uh, together with uh, Peter Albravas and, um, and with John Noonan, we've just started, we've taken advantage of the, the sort of COVID layover to start a new company called uh, Clever Planning with Geology. So, you know, we're, we're going to show you a little bit what that's about, but um, my basic history is, is I have um, degrees in oceanography and, um, and geochemistry, and I've been a practicing geophysicist for about uh, 20, 20 years uh, all around the world. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. And I guess all of the students, uh, they would be um, interested in knowing about the topic itself, how important is it, and also your case studies. Yep. Okay. So perhaps I can kick off. Um, as construction management students, you should all have a good understanding of the construction phase of the project life cycle. However, you must also be aware of the full project life cycle so you can understand the preparation and planning that has led to the construction phase and the expectations of the owner in the project asset management or operations and management phase of the life cycle after you've completed your construction work. <clears throat> construction projects range in size across a spectrum of both value and complexity from the smallest to the very largest. At the very largest end of the spectrum, construction mega projects are valued in the US decabillion dollar range. Examples of such mega projects in Australia are I'll give you two examples, one LNG plant, 
like the Gorgon 3 train LNG plant in WA, valued at $88 US billion by the end of the construction phase, or the 3 2 train LNG plant on Curtis Island in Queensland, each valued in the order of $20 billion or a total of $60 billion US dollars by the end of the construction phase. And there are many more LNG plants in the decabillion dollar range in Australia as well. In defence, acquisitions like the Air Warfare Destroyer, project value of around six billion US dollars, or the Hunter Frigate project, project value of about 30 billion US dollars, or the attack class submarines valued at around 50 billion dollars in the construction phase. Now, owners invest billions in the preparation phases of the mega project life cycle, an investment designed to secure expert estimates of predictable, simultaneous time to construct and cost of construction for the final investment decision prior to construction. Paradoxically, the estimates and predictions are always wrong. The consequence is NPV losses, net present value losses, measured in the US billions per mega project, or cumulative global mega project losses measured in the US trillions of dollars per annum. The graph shown on slide two is from the 2012 performance assessment report from the Construction Industry Institute out of the University of Texas Austin campus, Engineering and Economics faculty. The graph is a plot of 975 mega projects from the CII's owner community. The graph shows a few key points. First, the owners identified the target tolerance around the origin of the graph of project cost growth, plus or minus 3% versus project schedule growth, plus or minus 2.7%, which represents predictable performance in the construction phase to the owner's requirements. Two, Mega projects fail to achieve the owner's predictable goals 95% of the time. Three, there are four modes of failure to perform in construction. One is over time and over budget. Two is cost driven projects. Three is schedule driven projects. And the fourth is a bit counterintuitive to many under cost and under schedule projects. Four, it is suspected that of the 5% of projects that fell in the success box in this graph, owners may well have moved the goalposts after construction was completed so they could successfully report a predictable construction result. Today, you will hear about a key application, the MyGeo Twin Integrated Digital Ground Model, which is a critical tool for resolving the mega project paradox in the construction phase. After this lecture, you will understand why MyGeo Twin must be used in the initiation and planning phase of any construction project on land or sea, as well as during construction and asset management phases, and even in the decommissioning phase. Using MyGeo Twin will allow the owner of the mega project the very best chance of avoiding the mega project paradox by deciding, first, where it is most important to build the pro mega project, second, what form the mega project construction strategy should take, and third, how best to build the mega project or design for constructability. Over to you, Jason. Yeah, thanks very much, John. So if we, if we look um, a little bit deeper into what John's just discussed, so um, John's talking about the mega project or the project as a whole, um, but if we look down a little bit deeper into what's going on during the planning and initiation phases, 50% um, of all cost and time overruns for civil engineering products are caused by unforeseen ground conditions, okay? Half of all projects that are going on at the moment run over cost or budget because of the ground conditions. So if you think about that, 100% of projects will be inappropriately priced or engineered to account for that. But basically, contractors do not believe what is delivered to them by planners. And that has a, heap, that has a lot of downstream um, problems for, uh, for contracting and project delivery. Um, very little infrastructure today, to, built today, is sustainable. So I, I want to highlight that. No matter what you hear about sustainable designs, no matter what you see about the top side of buildings, louvers, um, um, solar passive, all of that, none of that is significant when you consider that if you are pouring tons and tons and tons of concrete into the foundations unnecessarily, you will never make up for any, any, any you know, the loss of sustainability um, for that. So if you wanna do sustainable design, you have to start with the geology. 
All right. So on a little bit of a lighter side, um, we have a lot and a lot of fun doing what we're doing. So, so to put it in context, um, we travel around the world and we collect geological data. Um, we do small boat jobs. Um, we do, uh, this is a, a diamond survey in uh, Namibia. Uh, this is a deep water survey um, off a big boat. We're, we're, we're operating in around 120, 200 metres of water. Um, we do land surveys and interestingly enough, we do, um, we can work in the swash zone. So we collect um, the ground data and we collect digital ground data. And so a lot of what this talk is about is um, delivering digital data into the project initiation phase so that we can impact um, the uh, design of the project and make sure that um, planners are able to deliver what the customer needs in a sustainable, cost-effective manner. Um, in the marine environment, um, we chug along in our boat. Um, we have an umbilical going down to the seabed, and then we tow our active cable on the seafloor. Okay, a lot of the secret source for um, collecting data effectively is to actually have your cable in contact with the ground that you are measuring, be that the seafloor or, um, or the, uh, the land. Okay, all these aerial surveys and, and midwater surveys are great, but you lose a lot of accuracy with that. Um, so we're all about high definition engineering surveys. <clears throat> um, as I said, we work all around the world and we have a huge amount of fun doing it. Um, this is uh, a job in Namibia, it gives you an idea of a small boat survey. Um, and this is actually collecting multiple. Um, They're quite noisy. On this job here, you can see we've got a mix of um, seabed surveys, multiple um, We're doing uh, animal surveys in terms of movements of the and we've got our advanced um, There's a lot going on on these boats. Uh, lots of power being uh, generated um, and We've got to make sure that all these systems are working in time, so the timing's done well, and, um, and there's no cross instruments. So it's quite an art form to get these boats set up in, uh, in this kind of manner. Um, what the jobs actually look like, um, you have your little boat sailing along. This is a a uh, visual demonstration done by a, a partner of ours for us. Um, the boat sails along, um, or, or the land gear for that matter. Um, you're collecting data um, from the seabed. And there's the waterfall that we generate. We get a lot of this data um, live as we go. Um, so we can do um, inline corrections if we need to, if we see issues with the equipment or um, we think we need more or less data in a particular area or can make on the fly decisions. One of the big things with our data is we get line data, but we also are looking 15 to 20 meters either side of the cable. So we can start to stitch everything together. Once we have this unified map, we look to um, doing some ground truthing. So we'll drop in some, in this case, fibre cores or uh, other geotechnical methods like boreholes. And because ground modeling is a science, we target our boreholes to anomalies, and then we um, look to tie in the results of the boreholes um, with what we find in our maps. And in this case, we're generating a, a, a survey plan to, find, to dig out this muck, um, because that's the contaminated stuff. And it's all about targeting um, what's important, uh, rather than trying to do the whole lot. So, in terms of the point cloud, um, what we're trying to do is develop an actual point cloud. So you can see that we're moving away from traditional paper-based survey techniques and 2D and 1D analog surveys, and we're moving into uh, a reality-based um, digital engine that you can actually use interactively and test um, and, and prototype in. 
and and I, and I think that's the real key is once you have these point clouds is you can actually start prototyping. Um, okay, so let, let's move on to a case study then. So this job um, was for a port development um, in Papua New Guinea. And the idea was that we had to locate, uh, or the, the owner had to locate sufficient construction strand as sand and they had to <coughs> understand the most effective place to build the port and then the associated ground risks with building the port in that area. They had to understand where to build the approach channels and also the associated ground risk with those approach channels. Um, we got into the job um, two or three years after, a, after the a, a first studies were done. And, you know, it, this is Papua New Guinea, so it's a remote area, very difficult to, um, to get to and very difficult to operate in. If you break anything, that's it. You know, you're not getting spare parts real quick. So they spent two years, they spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on the ground acquiring data and millions and millions of dollars doing it. I think the final analog fee was somewhere around $10 million. At the mouth of the Fly River in Papua New Guinea, the, the report from the, um, the analog contractors was that they could not find sufficient construction sand. Right? They spent $10 million and they couldn't find any sand at the mouth of the Fly River. Um, and the other thing that they did is they, 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 they pushed the original port location to a secondary port location because they thought they found too many risks at that site. Um, and then they found, and then they, but they did, uh, they did locate a, um, a, a, a channel route, okay? So then after two years, we came in, um, we spent 20 days door to door. So, you know, we packed up all our equipment in Australia, flew it to Papua New Guinea, spent 10 days on the ground, um, and then flew home all within 10, all within 20 days. Um, we do on the fly processing. So we, we actually located 200 million cubic meters of sand in three days. Um, and then we, um, we found the associated risk with the new port location. Um, and, but more interestingly, we identified that, that where they thought they wanted to put their channel was in the completely the wrong location. So let's have a look at some of the results. So after two years and almost $10 million worth of studies, this is what they came up with, all right? They had a whole bunch of um, uh, boreholes in this area where they originally wanted to put their port, and then they abandoned all of this site and they moved it around to the north. Uh, they put a whole bunch of vibracores looking for sand in these areas, um, and they didn't find any sand. And of course, they put some boreholes along this area here just to try and track their, um, to try and prove the, uh, the channel location. Um, then we came along and these are our results. So all of this data that you see here, some 600 line kilometers of data was collected in 10 days. Um, we found, this is the approach channel to their new ports. We found a whole lot of uh, unknown risks in these areas. Um, all of this red stuff represents um, harder rock material that requires um, heavier dredging um, that they didn't know about. Um, we found a whole bunch of sand in here. So interestingly, all of these vibracores and boreholes were largely untargeted, and they missed all of these huge sand deposits in light blue here. And they missed all of these sand deposits here. You can see they found the silt, but they missed the sand just to the um, east of where they were looking. Um, and then most interestingly, here is their channel alignment and they perfectly picked out these rock um, outcrops here. Instead of going just uh, 300 meters to the east into this existing paleo channel. So I want to have a little bit of a, a more of a look at the um, paleo channel. So this is a zoom in here, and you can see that their 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 paleo or their their design has gone straight through these rock heads. Okay, now this channel was designed after the biggest survey contractor in the world put their best equipment and their best people on it. There was no lack of money spent, ten million dollars, right? And they came up with a channel design that missed the paleo channel just to the east of it and they picked out perfectly these rockheads, okay? 
These are the biggest guys using the best analog technology available in the world. And they missed completely where to put their channel and what dredging techniques to use um, to dig that channel. So the risk realities. Um, all projects go through a pretty standard um, list of phases, definition, planning, execution, monitoring, and closure. Um, and about this timeline here, we can look at risks in terms of downside risks, risks that detract value from the project, and upside risks, risks that add, can add value to the project if they're treated properly. So downside risks all live in the project execution, okay, late planning and project execution phase, right? And typical risks might include um, uh, the margins put on by contractors, the profile, or the risk profiles um, uh, designed uh, or decided by contractors, um, lack of innovation, poor project definition, poor contractor participation. If you have too many risks, you're only going to get people that can cope with risks, okay? So if you have lots of risks in your project, the project's going to be run by lawyers, not by um, innovative contractors. Um, if we look at some of the upside risks, um, collaborative tendering is, a, is an upside risk that adds lots and lots of value to a project. If you can collaborate with your contractors and with your um, delivery partners, you're going to have a lot more value added to the project than if you have a combative um, contracting or a combative relationship with your delivery partners. Um, insurances will be a lot less um, if you can um, uh, understand and collaborate and utilize risk on an upside basis rather than a downside basis. Um, and also if you decide where and what to build, okay? Where and what to build is gonna be a huge theme through the rest of this talk. Um, the value of all of these risks, okay? They're worth a lot of money at definition. As soon as you move away from definition and initiation into planning, the value of the upside risk becomes less and less until you move into execution where you have you know, very, very little opportunity to turn a downside risk into an upside risk. Um, so how does this relate into smart cities? Okay, where, what, how? Where am I gonna build stuff to satisfy customer needs? What am I gonna build to take advantage of the natural geology? And how am I gonna build it, right? If you get your where and your what right, your contractors are going to tell you how to build something effectively. That's what they're good at. They're good at the how bit. The planners and the initiation people have to have to tell you where and what to build. All right. So where lives in project initiation? Where am I going to put it? Right. If, if I've got to put people, if I've got to move people from A to B, where am I going to put my infrastructure to do that? That's initiation. All right. Once you've decided you're where, and some of it might be on geology, some of it might be on the, you know, the cadastre, what buildings are available, but either way, there's a where in there. Then the planners take care of what they're going to build. Okay, as soon as you've decided where you're going to build something, um, you can start to decide what is going to fit in that environment. And then in the execution phase, again, if you've got that where and what correct, um, your contractors are going to tell you how to effectively build something. Where, what, and how? Okay, the biggest value that in, in, in the biggest value for upside risk is going to live in where you put something, and then then the value detracts as you move down from what into the how. So the bulk of opportunity for sustainable design sits in the geology at project initiation. Okay, as soon as you've decided where you're going to build something, you have to look at the geology and figure out what is going to fit in the geology. So let's look at another case study then, the, the Sydney Metro. This is a really big high profile project that most of you guys know about. And we're specifically going to focus on the um, uh, Cross Harbour Tunnel. So the scope of the project was to locate the mo most appropriate path for the tunnel, right? And then you need to understand the geological risk associated with the tunnel. Um, and, and there's a lot of risk, right? You're, you're 40 metres below um, the seabed. And you're um, another, well, sorry, you're 20 metres below the seabed and then you're another 20 metres below the sea surface. So you're dealing with a lot of water pressures and if things go wrong, you're flooded in seconds. Um, 
And then you need to assist the tenders, tender as to provide a safe and competitive tender. Okay, this is a big one, safe and competitive tender. They're usually two words that don't come together, but you have to do that. Um, so there was a failure in the legacy systems, right? They, they went out and they spent, again, similar to, to Papua New Guinea earlier, they spent two years and hundreds and hundreds of hours of acquisitions and millions and millions of dollars trying to process the data to provide a clear understanding uh, of the geology. Everybody thought it was a simple geological setting, but in actual reality, under the harbour there, it is an incredibly complex setting filled with microfractures and paleo channels and, and, and incised valleys and so on, um, uh, as well as shales and sandstones li living together. Um, now, they failed, in the first instance, they failed to sufficiently understand the, particularly the northern section of that alignment um, and to give them a clear understanding of the geology. But by this time, um, the, you know, the rest of the project couldn't wait for the, uh, the harbour guys to um, sort out their understanding of the geology. And the, the stations were already placed either side of, um, in Barangaroo and, and, and on the northern side. The, the stations were already placed before they had a good understanding of the geology, right? So they had to, in the end, they had to make do with um, with what they had. So the success of the MyGeo twin, all right? So these guys spent two years on the legacy systems. Um, we went out there and in five days, we acquired all of the data that we needed and we delivered it in a, in a four-dimensional um, framework for them. We confirmed the borehole interpretation on the southern areas. And then we highlighted very, very large discontinuities or, or misunderstandings on the northern areas. Um, and we then provided targeting information for those northern areas. A lot of what we do is providing um, borehole targeting. Right? Geophysics will never replace boreholes, but we will provide targeting for boreholes to make sure that those boreholes are put in the right spot and that you understand all of the anomalies in the area. So. Let's have a look at the process and, and, and the legacy process and technology that was deployed on the job. And this is a pretty typical sort of scenario. You deploy your reflection, um, and reflection is a two-dimensional analog um, data acquisition. And uh, all you're trying to do is find the depth to the layers, right? You, you have no idea what those layers consist of or if those layers are hetero or homogeneous, if they're the same or if they're changing. All you're saying is that there are layers at certain heights and you get um, a, a kind of an image like this, right? So, so this brown layer here is the, the, what they think is the rock and they go through all of their different seismic sections and pick up what they think is the rock and then they link them all together and produce um, a, a, a rock surface like this, okay? So this is the rock surface sitting roughly um, 20 metres below the seabed. Um, they did some refraction, and these are the rainbows that everyone talks about, and I'll look a little bit more about uh, the, the pros and cons of refraction in a moment. And, of course, then you have boreholes, and we'll look at the pros and cons of boreholes in a minute. And from these three analogue techniques, and you can see that they're all delivered to the owner on pieces of paper, on disparate pieces of paper, and it's up to the owner to go through and look at all of these data sets and bring them together. And again, they bring them together on a piece of paper. Um, interestingly, and also quite frighteningly, um, this cross section here is made in Microsoft Excel. So the, the billion dollar cross harbour section of the tunnel and just just going across the harbour cost around a billion dollars the cross section delivered to contractors to do their risk assessment and planning on was written in excel All right so that's the current legacy state of play um i want to um i want to then contrast this sort of legacy stuff with um, the MyGeo twin that was delivered in five days. Um, so we we live on the um, net, all our data is net, net delivered now. So um, I'll just open up Metro. Okay, so here we've got Metro. I'll just bring down the vertical exaggeration to one. 
Uh, I'm just going to put on uh, the point cloud so you can see what's going on. And turn that on. Okay. So similarly, we have all our data in the point cloud. Okay. So all of this was collected in one day. Uh, sorry, uh, two days. Um, I'm just going to turn this off and this is the um, legacy data. All right. So the blue stuff on the top is the bathymetry and the, the, this, this redder sort of ochre color is the uh, surface of the, um, the rock that was determined by um, legacy technology. Now, one of the interesting things that you can see from this is that according to this kind of map, it seems that this whole area is comprised of the same material, right? So in, in the case of Sydney Harbour, it's a sandstone. And that is absolutely not the case, right? It is, it's comprised of compacted sand. It's comprised of... Um, um, degrading sandstone, there's some shales in there, there's a whole heap of fracturing. So if we start to look at um, what is really going on in here, um, I can start to draw some sections on through here, and, and these are drawn on the fly. And if I get rid of the base map, we can start to see how the Aquarez data is really lining up, except in this area here, okay? And these boreholes were later found to be largely incorrect because they missed the, this big lump here, all right? They misinterpreted these, these boreholes. They didn't start coring until very low and, uh, and they misinterpreted this lump in here. And you can see that the tunnel alignment goes straight through here and misses this entirely second this this entire area, which is a secondary paleo channel. Um, another interesting thing to look at is if we come down. So this is the rock surface that was delivered by the the legacy reflection technology, and you can see that the rock surface, this green in here, is actually continental sediments, not rock. And the green in here, uh, the, the, rock, the, the rock surface determined by the reflection technology is over 10 metres above where the rock surface actually is, as, as is determined by the boreholes. Right? So the legacy technology really didn't cut what's going on. And we can sort of see why that is, is if, if we go and start to look at the raw data. Um, and the raw, so if we come in here and zoom out, we can see the raw data that makes up this section. And there's a whole heap of problems in here. There's a whole heap of, you can start to see how that this rock section here doesn't line up with the surface it's actually created. Now, this is quite common. And again, there's big gaps here where the rock section should be and the surface is actually lying. This is quite common. Again, in here, there's a big gap between where the rock surface should be according to the raw data and where the processed rock section is. So I won't spend too much more time on that other than to say you need to be very careful with these two dimensional sections and you need to understand the raw data and where it's coming from. And those errors that I just highlighted there are one of the main reasons that contractors never believe planners because they're not given the raw data and they're not able to make their own decisions about how the raw data actually relates to the real circumstance. So moving on, um, the different technologies deployed, seismic reflection, um, all we're trying to do is pick up depth to layer. All right, so depth to layer. Someone goes to and takes these sonograms from the raw data and they go and they hand draw 
where they think the relevant sections are or the relevant steps are. And then they take the next one and the next one and the next one. If these are processed on a Friday night when the guy, when the person wants to go and have their uh, their shandies, then these are rushed. All right. But, you know, it's very rare that these segwise sections or raw sections are actually delivered to the customer. So it's almost never the case that these are checked. Um, there's a whole bunch of errors. Basically, your source comes down. You need to determine the sonic velocities for all of these. So these heights can be a long, long way out. Um, and I won't go into too many of the more problems here, but understand that this is a complex and manual interpretation of these sections that needs to be understood. Um, and very few people beyond um, the geotechnical guy or the, the geologist that took this data understand. But you need to know that, be aware that there's a lot of manual interpretation in here that needs to be understood. Seismic refraction, again, this is even more, um, this is even more black magic. Um, and delivering a, a coherent cross section from this kind of data is extremely difficult. Um, again, it's manual interpretation and not many people actually believe in, in refraction. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Other than to say there is no vertical data uh, it contained in this section, and the only way you get these vertical sections is you stretch the data to match a borehole. Right, so that you you can't contrast the the refraction data with a borehole. You because it's you can't process refraction without the borehole. Uh, and then you have advanced geophysical methods. Um, and advanced geophysical methods are digitally interpreted, so we don't touch our data um, manually. Um, they're multidimensional, so we collect depth to layer information and quality at the same time. Our active arrays are in contact with the seabed and the point clouds are available. So case study three, um, Luderitz in Namibia. This is quite an interesting study and it was the video we saw earlier. Um, and uh, and um, this was interesting because it combined legacy technology with advanced technology. And I'm going to go through some of the pros and cons of that just now. So here is the um, boomer plates, um, the noisemakers. Here's our gear going down the middle. We've only got one cable. And here is the receiving array. So here's the noisemaker and here's the receiving array. Um, what were the outcomes? Well, in terms of the quality of the data, the, the depth to layer information was pretty well spot on between both systems um, where it worked. But you can see here that the, ref the reflection survey completely missed um, the bottom in this area because of a phenomenon called gas masking. OK, so our, our technology went straight through this gas masking area um, with shallow gas. And, uh, and found the bottom regardless. This is quite a common occurrence. Um, and it, again, is something to be looked out at. Um, case study four, four is Flinders Port. Um, and this was quite interesting because it was uh, the, um, the owner went out and got a whole lot of uh, geophysical and geotechnical data and, um, and uh, went, to, went to market with that data. But Sadly for them, it turned out that their data was completely wrong because they'd used the um, legacy technology inappropriately. And the dredge companies came along and, and figured this out and, uh, and, and they made a lot of money out of variations for this job. Um, so this is the basic setting. Um, they wanted to deepen the channel in this area here. And this was the data that the channel that that the um, that the owners went to market with, and you can see it's a typical occurrence of soft material over hard. Um, and they thought it was a very easy job uh, for the dredge companies to do. And when they got their low dredge prices, that was what they expected it to be. But when the dredge companies got out to Australia and um, um, actually tried to dredge, they found it was actually very hard on the top and very soft underneath. And so this completely changed the dredge parameters and it meant that they mobilized from Europe with the wrong equipment, had to send everything back to Europe and then bring out new equipment for the job. So it was incredibly expensive for the uh, Flinders Port Corporation, this job here. 
So refraction, um, it only works in ideal circumstances where you've got soft material increasing to hard material. Um, if you've got hard over soft, the um, you're going to get so much noise created in this hard layer that you're going to get no visualization of what's going on on the bottom. Um, and it will always look as though you've got soft material over hard. Um, discontinuities, if you have a vertical discontinuities, um, you're never going to get this kind of information out of refraction. Um, and again, if you're towing midwater, um, you're going to get a whole heap of errors just in this section there. Um, if you've got vertical layering, so now we're looking at a plan view. If you've got hard material, either bounding soft material, you're never going to get information about this soft material because um, you'll get so much noise created by the bounding hard stuff. Uh, and microfracturing as well, you can't pick this out. So case study five, um, let's look at Cape Canaveral. Um, here, this is a, another really, really interesting project because they needed to do some channel deepening again. Um, they'd collected, this is a 70 year old port, right? And whenever you talk to port owners, they're gonna be like, oh, I don't need to know anything more about my port. I've been operating it for 70 years. And in this case, they had 264 boreholes. But fortunately for the port on this particular channel deepening job, they had a, a, a person that actually was able to sit back and say, you know what, every time we do a study, the um, conclusions of the study are completely different to the conclusions of um, the contractors. So in this instance, um, we were able to go in at project initiation phase. Um, and we found some really interesting stuff. This gives you an idea. So this is Cape Canaveral. Uh, this is the this is where they launch all their rockets from up from up this area up here. And you know a lot of the SpaceX comes basically sailing in through this port um, every every time they capture one of their or they land one of their rockets. So that gives you a context, and this gives you an idea of how many boreholes these people have. So this gives you an idea that it doesn't really matter how many boreholes you have unless you link the things together with um, some kind of geophysical information, um, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, you don't really have a clue about what's going on. So what we found was, um, and, and what in 70 years, nobody realized the implications of this. So what you have in, in Cape Canaveral is you have a layer of clay sitting over a soft material up here. And this clay here is fed by a freshwater spring. Okay, so this is Florida, and Florida is sitting atop freshwater, and and it 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 it's protected in this instance by this clay layer. And what happens is every time you damage the um, top of this clay layer, um, salt water intrudes in on it, and it changes the geotechnical parameters. Okay, and it makes the it it changes from a hard, competent clay into a soft, um, more malleable clay when you put the salt water in it. So basically what's been happening is, is, you know, they've been going and doing the geotechnical studies, finding fresh water, and then they go away and say, okay, we have a nice hard clay bottom. And then when you start to put your infrastructure in it, you do your piling in it, all the salt water comes in around the piles and quickly changes the, um, the geotechnical parameters into a soft, mushy goo. Um, and, uh, and and they have to wait for three weeks um, while the ground settles, and then they can go on and build. And, it, you know, interestingly here, we can see the end of the clay, and this is where all the freshwater springs percolate up. And, and, and all the fishermen know this because they go and collect their um, fish here because it's a very, very nutrient um, active water. So after 70 years, a simple um, uh, advanced geophysical study answered all of their questions as to why the ground changes whenever they stick something in it. Um, so let's look at boreholes. Um, boreholes, they're not a scientific um, study. They're a, they're a remote sensing technology. They're very, very highly disturbed. They're non-continuous, and they certainly don't produce a carbon copy of the ground. Okay, so these are your basic drill heads, and you can see that these things go through and churn up all the ground, and then the cuttings go back through the middle um, and come up the center of the core tube. 
Okay, every every few meters, you stick um, a, a sampling device. You, you stop drilling and you stick a, a sampling device through the middle here, and you collect about a, a fifty centimeter um, a fifty centimeter uh, sample. So this is the fifty centimeter um, sample, and and then you do all your testing on that. Um, and in between times, in between when you do that sampling. You get the the cuttings coming up with the cutting with the drilling fluids, and the geologist uses that to determine what's going on between um, these sampling techniques. So drilling boreholes are not a scientific technique. They don't produce a carbon copy of the ground, um, and they're certainly not trusted by contractors. And they they're only as good as the confidence you can provide that they are representative of the ground. All right. So in the case of Cape Canaveral, there was no confidence here that 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 the what you took at this area here was representative of the entire area. So Eden Port, let's look at another example of the um, the um, uh, the boreholes. So in this case here, this was an owner driven project um, and we got in at the project initiation phase. There were some initial studies that had been done and um, and uh, and um, uh, there were some initial construction strategies underway. So they knew they thought they knew where their, their dredge area was going to be. They thought they knew where they were going to put their wharf um, structures. Um, and then sort of we came in and, and, and redid everything for them. And, and, and the outcomes of our studies were that um, we better understood the, the, the rock layout. And we allowed, because of that, we allowed local dredge companies to go and compete with European dredge companies and change the dredge strategy slightly. And, and the outcome was that we saved $4 million for the, uh, the, the owner um, in dredge costs and a $1 million in piling costs. So the initial the initial strategies were formed on a, a handful of legacy or, or you know 40 year old 50 year old boreholes taken from around the 70s. Um, and you can see that there's no rock uh, that was found along the construction alignment. Then they did some legacy geophysics and they found a couple of layers. This was thought to be the layer between the soft movable sediments and the more compacted sediments. And this red layer here was thought to be the rock. But it didn't conform at all with the existing boreholes. So we went and did our studies. And again, we didn't conform either with the legacy geophysics. We kind of a little bit maybe with the legacy geophysics, but not really and not at all with the existing boreholes. So we ordered some targeted boreholes to figure out what this anomaly here is, what this red stuff was, and this red stuff here is. Anyway, so we did our targeted boreholes and we have rock, rock down here, not rock, rock, and not rock, all right? So there's this really interesting vertical discontinuity in here that we found. Um, and if we look at that from a point of view of, um, the Mygea twin. So I'll switch to Eden. Apologies. So if we look at what's going on here, this is the um, alignment in here for the um, the wharf construction. And all we need to do is put in, draw a line in here. Sorry, I'll just edit that a bit. So I can do all sorts of interesting editing on the fly here. Which, sorry, it's not giving me that. I'm just going to come in a bit further. Okay, so there, there's our anomaly in there. And if we push this back away, 
you can see that anomalies perfectly in there. And I'm just going to push this away because it's kind of interesting how it it's only in this area. This is a SODS law environment where this anomaly only exists right on the construction alignment. So if I go, if I just turn this around, you can see that it's fading away. And by the time I get out and away from there, there's no more anomaly left. OK, so the anomaly only exists in that exactly where they wanted to put their um, their uh, um, construction. And you can look at that in the horizontal. Again, we can just clip through our, there's a, a point cloud in there. And you can see there's the anomaly in there. And if we go down a bit further, by the time you get to uh, minus um, 18 metres, the anomaly is completely gone. So it's just in there that that anomaly is sitting. And this here saved them a million dollars in piling costs because they were prepared for it. Um, so looking at, um, looking at what a digital twin is and isn't, so a 2D image is just not has no relevance in, in, in modern construction or 3D digital twins, OK? We used to play Pong on a computer, but now we play um, the Xbox 360 or PlayStation or whatever you like, OK? We used to draw things by hand, but now we work in three and four dimensions, OK? These are the old two-dimensional analog systems. Um, we need to move to point clouds. To realise the potential of the civil infrastructure, we need to look at verified geology, verified geology, and we have to be able to integrate our planned construction into that to test the scenarios that we want um, to test. We can't have these circumstances anymore where we've got um, pile designs being done without regard for geology. We have the technology now to put this all in a gaming sort of reality engine and do all of our piling um, uh, in, 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 in the real geology and see what happens when we do pile in that. We can do a complete simulation in the reality engines before we go into the field. And understanding point clouds requires a ground up rethink of how we do construction and how we progress with smart cities. You have one chance to get a point cloud and that is um, at the beginning when the field is green. So this stuff is old and broken and has absolutely no relevance um, to, to modern day construction. It's only in the reality engines that we can do sustainable design and build smart cities. This is, um, and this is an example of how we can use that. This is uh, AutoCAD Civil 3D, point clouds are sitting in there. These are a bunch of mate, uh, mates of ours that build three uh, uh, holographic engines down in South Australia, put all of our data into a hologram. This is uh, one of the leading digital consultants that has built a, a reality engine to take um, our point clouds. Um, we push everything to Google Earth um, because one of the keys to this sort of data is pushing all of this data into a simple, easily understood environment. Um, we can push everything to the web, as you've seen via our um, digital twin or via um, Cesium. Uh, and of course, we can do 4D analysis in some of the better um, GIS applications. John. John, Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Um, so I'd like to finish off by saying that Jason has identified the legacy systems of little value in understanding the ground on which your project will be constructed. It is tantamount to fraud in 2020 for any consulting engineering organisation or consultant of any kind to suggest to an owner that legacy systems can possibly inform the owner of the true state of the ground on which they build their project. In that sense, the owner has historically treated their project ground as a known unknown and any risk pushed to the non-owner constructor under an appropriate construction contract. As construction management students, you have heard for the first time today about a 3D ground modeling tool called MyGeoTwin. MyGeoTwin changes how owners must treat the ground on which they decide to build their project. 
My Geo Twin makes the owner's project ground a known known for the first time. Jason identified how the My Geo Twin ground model makes legacy systems redundant. My Geo Twin changes the process for the owner. In the project initiation and planning phases, the owner needs to collect the My Geo Twin ground model and use it in two key ways. First, My Geo Twin must be used to plan a better borehole logging scheme that is designed to verify the project ground model in difficult areas for the construction work. Second, once the ground model is verified, the owner can then make the best decision about where, what and how to build their project so that they come out with a predictable solution um, in the construction phase. My Geo Twin is the geology digital twin of your project ground. It must be used in all of your projects as the frame of reference for your construction project and any BIM models used. So over to you, Samad. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was fantastic, and uh, I guess uh, the students, they enjoyed uh, learning about the, the technology itself and also a few case studies. So I'm going to ask the students if you have any questions you can ask uh, Jason and John. <coughs> any questions? Okay, so I guess uh, J Jason and John uh, would be available in the future as well if someone wants to learn a little bit more or uh, they have any questions uh, later, even after the term, because because we actually yes, Samad. Yes, I was going to suggest that both Jason and I are active on LinkedIn, and. Okay. Um, we can provide you with our email addresses if you uh, would like to let the students send yeah. us an invitation to link yes. in. Yeah, yeah. Even even uh, in the conversation box, you can leave your email address as well. And I guess the LinkedIn is also a good uh, solution because Jason, John, and myself, all of us are on LinkedIn and sometimes we discuss or comment on different kind of things. So you can join us and also uh, learn a little bit more or ask any questions if you want. So, all right. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really valuable and particularly like the technology itself and the approach, your approach, uh, I guess it's very novel and uh, useful to the industry. I guess it will change the practice in the future and I hope it will happen a bit quicker. Thanks, Samad. Samad, yes. I just uh, letting you know, I can't, I don't have access to your conversation box, so I'll oh, okay. tell you. Yeah, tell me, I will share with the students. I will share yeah. the uh, details, contact details with the students, and I'm sure students, are, some of them are uh, going to watch the recordings later. So if they've got any question, they will um, ask you and Jason. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Okay, so now we have uh, uh, like a very short uh, break if you want, like a minute, and then we can uh, continue the session with tutorials. Lauren, can you hear me? Okay, so I guess uh, uh, Lauren and uh, other mentors are available on the uh, a specific channel they created already, so you can join to your session and learn about uh, 
uh, tutorial. Lauren is going to discuss the questions today, like tutorial questions, and as well as uh, wiki pages as well. So you can you can join uh, your tutorial and learn more. But if you've got any question right now from me, you can ask me. OK, we've got one one uh, uh, question about the exam. Actually, like in, in theory, everything we provide in the lecture section will be covered by the exam in theory. But in practice, I will talk to you guys in the following week to see how we can uh, help you guys to prepare in a shorter uh, time and then uh, uh, we'll let you know more about the exam. So at this stage, you don't need to be worried about the exam. So the only thing uh, you need to uh, focus on is your um, wiki group project. And then I encourage everyone to attend in the following live session. In the following week's live session, we will discuss uh, the exam details, what you need to do, what should be, uh, what will be covered and what will not be covered. All right. OK, so uh, there is one question about the video. The video should be 10 minutes, but if you've got more than 10 minutes, it will be OK. But if 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 you want to check me, me you can do that. You can share your video. I can give you some comments on your videos on your video. And I'm happy to have quick chat or meeting with you or your your group as well. I, I ask all of mentors to um, have an uh, individual meeting with your group and I'm trying to attend some of those meetings. I missed one or two of them, I guess, but I'm trying to attend most of them. So if you've got any question about your videos, your wiki pages, um, myself and my team, all mentors, we are happy to help you, give you some uh, quick feedback on your work. Okay. All right, so I guess tutors and mentors are ready for you guys and uh, and I'll see you again uh, next week. Thank you for uh, listening and being in this session.